thank you for your kind invitation to present our work on blind testing of fibers. Blind testing is a protocol which allows us to check the validity of our diagnostic features that we've identified. It has been used before, particularly in two-word analysis and in funnel analysis, with limited success. It is, of course, used in the calibration of radiocarbon dating, and there's an extensive program of that which we know that we can rely on that blind testing technique. The aims of our research is to validate the reliability of the morphological factors that we've been looking at in the past. These are the circularity, and I should explain that. The circularity is a non-dimensional feature, which is a comparison of the area of a fibre as against its perimeter, and allows us to compare fibres of different size in a strict same way. The microfiber angle, everybody is aware of the microfiber angle. When I demonstrate this to our students, I say I'm looking at a clock, and I can see that if I'm after 12 o'clock, I'm on Z format. If I'm before 12 o'clock, I'm on S format. And I realise now that when you look at that, you see the opposite. I should really be doing that that way, shouldn't I? We know that there are various factors that we've looked at in the past in terms of the diagnostic features for fibre. We looked at chemical analysis, and we realised that that's dependent both on the growing conditions, on the harvesting and processing following the gathering. And certainly <coughs> the work that Sherman and Foy have done in the past, and the regular did on some of the test back planting, we know that the chemical composition varies along the size of the stem itself. It is a not a reliable factor. Free transform has been used as well on infrared um, expansions. And Howell Edwards reported on that on the mummy cloth that he looked at, particularly the cotton. One of the difficulties we have is you cannot stretch that level into infrared because the autofluorescence within the fibre itself overrides the image that you're looking at. Howell Edwards took it as far as near infrared, but beyond that level we couldn't move much further. DNA analysis, we're all well aware of. There is no nuclei within the fibres. There's no DNA you can test there. When Dunbar and Murphy did, looked at, did their work, they were taking the DNA from associated material with that fibre. Fibre analysis, that's not reliable. The museum archivists would let, let, let you set fire to all the samples to produce some carbonized remains. And again, there's a very small catalogue of the actual title presentation. The material properties have been looked at extensively because of the now modern demand for composite materials which contain, contain fibres rather than glass fibre. It's an environmental concern. But it has the same problem that you have when you're doing the chemical analysis, that material properties, particularly the Young's modulus, varies as per the analysis there. Whatever features we identify, and this has been raised before, then they have to be robust, so that it will stand up to identification. Minimally invasive, minimally destructive, and capable of reproduction by other parties. The ones we chose, and this is some of the work we did previously, which we presented at the um, EA conference in um, March a couple of years back. Microfiber angle, particularly. You look at this sample we've got on the top of the chart there. You can see that for nettle, we've got a microfiber angle S. Flax has also got a microfiber angle, and hence it's easy to cross that the other way around. When you look at the image that we projected there, these images are done from small samples of fiber in distilled water mountains with a cover glass on top. And then a detailed analysis of the fiber through the microscope of foreign magnification, you can actually see these fibres represented there. There's a problem, I'll come back to that in the future. But certainly when you look at the fibres now, you can see that hemp is well separated from nettle and flux. The analysis of ovarian shows us in fact that there is a distinct difference between the two, significant difference between the two. Similarly for cross-sectional circularity. 
we're aware of the subjective judgment we have that a nettle fibre is ovate, a long thing, and that flax and hemp both have polygonal shapes, sometimes much more difficult to differentiate between the two. In this factor, we can separate nettle from flax and hemp. The, the variation, analysis variation, shows nettle that stands alone down there. That's the background to the work that we did and the work that we reported two years back. And that's the ones, when we put them together, we get this sort of separation. You get hemp, the top end there. The inner circle is 95% probability. And the outer circle, you can just see on the annulus there, 99%. Um, nettle and flat at the bottom. Now that's the program that we put to the blank test. Circularity and microfiber angle demonstrate a significant differential. The challenge is, will they stand up to the blank test protocol? Which is a randomized collection. So we need the aim is to evaluate this, the reliability of the plant fiber and those diagnostic features. And there was a problem. This is a problem identified by Luxova and Simone over the last couple of years. And it's the direction or the position you look at the fibre. The microfiber angles are available to you, this magnification. And if you get the wrong side, if you look at the posterior one, that's the one on the left, it tends to be slightly out of focus. So you know you're actually looking through something else as well. The top focus is the one that matters, microfiber angle on the top fiber, and you can actually see the shape of that fiber because you're demonstrating its own angle. And if you look closely, you can actually see on the right hand side the back one, that ground is the one between. We can analyze this difference either by looking at the variation on the straight rotation from the microscope to bring that microfiber angle up into orientation. And that's the method we chose. Cross section of circularity. This is analysed under image tray analysis. That image tray software is available um, to anybody. It's used particularly with the medical profession to identify cell formats and such like. But because I'm looking at circularity and not individual dimensions, I'm looking at a non-dimensional factor which allows me to compare between the two. Those are the two that we decided to look at. Have we gone through all that pain, barrier? We now arrive at the blind test. I've only taken a section of the blind test structure here, so you can see how we're working at them. You've got the sample number, the fiber diameter determined by the scale within the microscope itself, the start angle of the stage set on the underneath the viewing, and the final angle. The difference tells me the angle, microfiber angle. You can also compare that through another software program. Uh, image SS, which will allow you to do the enclosed angle between the two. So there are other ways of measuring the microfiber angle. We took the, uh, the um, differential between the two. Um, we then did the circularity, image of J circularity, between 0.7 and down to 5. That circularity figure for a circle is 1. The area and the perimeter match up 1. For a thin line with very little area, it's about 0. A long parameter. No area with it. And if the fibres stand somewhere betwixt in between, depending on the rate between the oviality and the circularity. That's the, we coded them at the side in colours to show the flux and metal combined, this first stage, and the hemp on the second stage. This is a full 48 listing of the samples. I realise that's a challenge to your eyesight. It's also a challenge to your capabilities of cameras you have on your phones. You can see what the fact is that on the top level, on the right hand side, we've got the fiber, the flax and nettle in one group identified, and the hemp identified lower down. The gaps between them are those samples which fail the test. The pale blues just inside that are the positive ones, and the pinks are the negative ones. You can study that, I've made it easy for you schematic on the side. First question is what sample size do you require? If you already know the population structure that you have, then you can backtrack and decide the sample size is quite low. It's about 12. That's not me being right, it's me being taken to task by a very earnest young statistician who reminded me 
the archaeologists tend to search for sample sizes which are way beyond the need. So we took 16 instead of the 12 from each fibre. And the 16 fed into the 48 group of the, what we were, the fibres we were looking at. One had a fail. That's gone off to the right hand side. It didn't stand up to the test procedure process. It dissolved itself. So the MFA division, which is the first division we looked at, was to separate on the microfiber angle. That left us with hemp to the right hand side, 18, and 29 fibers to the other side, 47 in total. Two of them again were unsuitable because they didn't stand up to the process. And when we did actually get to the final level, we had 18 plant fibers identified as hemp. Of the 29 we put into the second stage, where we're looking at the circularity, again we divided that between 13 identified as nettle and 14 which initially identified as flax. And the bottom line circle tells you how successful we were. Nine of the nettle, of the original 16, were identified. Ten of the flax were also identified. And of the hem, 13 in circle identified. From the 45 samples available to us, we identified 71%. In blind testing, that's a pretty good figure. For the fibers individually, we had 64%, my eyesight being a tip me, I'll look at this one, 64% for nettle and 67% for flats. What we're really saying is that when we're looking at these things, we have to be very careful as to how we regard them, the subjective judgments that we make. When you look at the graph of these, you can see there's a grouping with flux holding its own group in top left, and hemp, the group in right. Nettle, as you would expect, being a poor quality product, a very difficult product to decodify and to comb, stands at the bottom level on its own, and it's much more scattered. The one on the right shows the ones we misidentified. The blackness of the misidentified, the circle outside shows us what they originally were. So on the side, we have three flaxes misidentified and two nickel, and three of the hemp on the other side. The statistics are shown again on the side of that, where the levels are. When we combine them, it looks like that. We have 10 correct identified, five misidentified on the fibers, and three rejected to give us the total of 71%. The comment, and my apologies to the non-English speaking people, because this is a typical English reflection, and that's to decide not to decide is a decision. <laughs> that's not my words, that's Dora's words. And what we're saying is on a subjective judgment, what we tend to do is we tend to push the boundaries, because we're experts. But if you identify an uncertainty, then that's really what drives our profession anyway. Because you say uncertainty leads to more research, and research leads to resolutions. To go to the level where we actually do decide. What Dora did when his work as criminal forensics is they decided to separate the people who do the on site inspection to the people who do the research. Because between the two, there is always some um, earmarking solution or comment. If you take someone along and say, is number one suspect? Does his fingerprints match? Yes, they will do, if you give them that hint at the front end. When Shelley and Nebraska looked at burials for sexing skeletons, she found that just by feeding a small element, which might be sexually indicative, was enough to persuade people to make the wrong identification. So imagine when we say to somebody that we have an artifact, which is from Mortar Weaver's excavation in a Brit an Iron Age site in Brittany, you've already encapsulated that identification within 30 formats. It's not a free discussion. So back to decide not to decide helps. In addition to the work we've now done with blind testing, the next challenge of course is how well did it stand up to degradation? We've run and just completed a test, a 48 week program of accelerated degradation um, under high, high temperature, 40 degrees C. We think we went to about four, 40, which we about four years degradation. And the work we're getting from that suggests that the diagnostic factors we've identified 
do stand up where they do survive, they're still there. We're also looking at how these would work in with archaeological artifacts. <coughs> we have access to artifacts from uh, Jordan, at 600, 6th century Jordan, and some Regency stuff as well. Yeah. So that's where we're going. That's the future work. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>